Good morning. And I thought they said only my friends were coming. So we're in the new era of paperless, and so I see everybody brought their handouts. That's what I planned on. So we have 100 handouts, okay? That's all we could make. So hopefully each agency will take a handout, and there's another 50 up here for this side. If you've ever given a presentation of this scope, you know there's a lot of logistics, and uh, my colleagues are helping. So, okay, so there's, this is not a test. Let me just introduce, because the handouts are going out. Uh, this is not a test, but if you want to maximize your learning, you won't look at the answers, okay? So can we all agree on that? Yeah. All right, good, okay, I thought we could. So it's great to be here. Uh, we did this last year in Burlingame, and I had no idea how it would go over, but it was a big hit. So we were all really happy about that, and we got a lot of good feedback, so we're back this year. I've incorporated the feedback that we got from the last presentation, so it's gonna be even better. If you were in Burlingame, you're gonna see some enhancements. So um, we, I do take uh, constructive criticism, um, constructively. There won't be any PowerPoint. This is gonna be a different kind of a presentation. Uh, I know everybody loves those PowerPoints, but um, I don't. Uh, the other thing I wanna mention is, uh, it, once you see these parts, you're gonna kinda of wonder, how did he get all this down here in one suitcase? Uh, TSA went through the luggage. I know that because I had a red Ziploc on there, and when I got it back, I had a giant white one on there. Uh, so it did fly. Everybody said, you're never gonna get on. That stuff looks like a bunch of bomb-making material. So I put the cover sheet for the Coupa Forum, I put the answer sheet, just in case they want to connect to DOS number 13. Oh, oh, that's a line leak detector. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> we didn't even know what that stuff is. So it got here. Uh, my buddies, as we were waiting for the plane, I said, if you hear my name, white courtesy phone, Robert Weston, go ahead and go without me. <laughs> so uh, luckily I didn't hear that. Uh, but we're here today to, to help debunk some of the mystery about underground tanks and the components and how everything fits together and you're pointing at this and you're pointing at that and the contractor saying, yeah, that's what we're testing. And then you look at the regulations and some of the terms, some of the pieces of equipment have two names. And you're, wait a minute, well, I thought it was that. No, it's this. Which, what is it? And what does that thing look like? When I started doing tank inspections in 1991, I had never seen anything underground. I just bought gas at a gas station. I didn't know all the terminology. My supervisor said, go out, learn everything, and come back with all your knowledge. So after 20 years, uh, I've done a lot of inspections and seen a lot of different things, a lot of horror stories, a lot of really good stuff. And uh, the good stuff's getting better. So I wanted to mention that we are videotaping this so that it could be uploaded to the website so that people that couldn't be here today will still be able to take advantage. And we're gonna do some, uh, some post-production work also to even uh, fine tune the presentation. So one thing, I, you know, in, in light of this uh, MTV videoing, did anybody know that the Koopa Conference has a whole hair and makeup uh, studio backsta backstage? <laughs> I didn't know that. Till they said, hey, you're gonna be on video, you gotta, you know, you gotta look good, so. Anyway, just in case you gotta be a speaker, there is support. Okay, so again, 1991 to the present, there's been a huge amount of changes. I, in two hours, I couldn't even cover those sorts of changes, and, uh, but we are going to um, see some things today. And the other thing that's, that's a little hard to um, keep track of is that in 1991, when I started doing tank inspections, there, were, there was no internet. You couldn't just Google electronic line leak detector, Vita root, ball float vent valve, and get a picture of it and see a little video. So if, I think the people that are coming into this business now have a huge advantage over, over when, I think, the, in the beginning days of not only just the underground tanks, but regulatory compliance in general for inspectors. The, the kind of information that you can get today is really overwhelming, and it's so helpful and so amazing in speeding along uh, your understanding, the facility's understanding, and making the whole uh, regulatory compliance program work more smoothly. I just wanted to mention that because a lot of people don't, don't remember that in 1991 there was no internet, but uh, 
so we had to learn the hard way, and uh, so we learned well, I think. And uh, so we first started putting this uh, equipment identification class on for internally for our tank uh, operators and owners. And we put together a designated operator training class so that they could become their own designated operator or if they wanted to hire a designated operator, at least they would know what kind of information they should be getting from the designated operator and just overall information about underground tank systems. Uh, it was, it's been a great class, been very successful. I think we've done it for uh, eight years now. And people call me about every six months, hey, could I come to that next class? When are you have holding the next class? I said, well, we only do it every two years. Oh, man. So we may look at doing it annually, but, um, so, again, with the handouts, if, you have, if there's two or three people from your agency here, if you can work together on filling in the answer sheet, all of this information is on the, on the website right now. I uploaded it on Friday, and uh, everything is there. So, um, any questions before we get started? Okay, so this is one of those things where, you know, you don't copy over your neighbor and that kind of stuff. So. Uh, Anyway, we have the stations. My colleague, Stephen Plunkett, is in the back. Stephen, can you raise your hand? I told Stephen that he was getting $250 for this if he would help me out. <laughs> then I found out there is no money for this. This is all volunteer, so if you can put a dollar in his belt or something, <laughs> he's gonna feel a whole lot better about this thing. Otherwise, next year, I'm gonna have to corral somebody else in the office, so. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go station to station. You're gonna see numbers on that uh, sheet that I have on the screen right now, okay? Those numbers correspond to the stations that you're gonna see back there with a piece of equipment. Now, on the, on the chart that you see, those are all integers. There's no uh, alpha characters there, but when you get back on your answer sheet, you, you have some alpha characters at the stations, okay, alphabetical. Those are not on this chart, but they are things that are associated with an underground tank system. So those are sort of, they're not necessarily wild card items, but they're things that I think everybody should be aware of. And so I included those in addition to the chart. So um, you, only, you not only have the numbers that are on the chart, but there's also other items that have uh, alpha characters. So um, any questions about what we're doing, comments? Yeah. <laughs> you come on up here and I'll explain it. Okay, so uh, if we can take some time now, and uh, it's 10.15, uh, we have two hours to do this, so if you go through the, the chart, and then we can come back and we're gonna go into detail, uh, Stephen and I, on each one of these items and give some background, what's the good and bad of this, what happens when they go wrong, and what are the potential problems and weaknesses of the equipment. So that's gonna help fill in the blanks. Yes? No, this is for motor vehicle fuels. No ammonia here. All right, Stephen, can you uh, help them conduct themselves back there? That's Stephen Plunkett, hazmat specialist to the world. All right, let's do it.
The other thing I meant to do before we got started was just by a show of hands, how many people have been doing tank inspections for 20 or more years? Okay. How about 15 or more? 10 or more? Five or more? All right. How about for only for less than a year? Okay, good. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through the answers and Stephen is going to put that up, he's going to hold up the item. Now you can see that there are, there are 32 items on this legend, okay. Obviously I couldn't bring a double wall tank. <laughs> I would have liked to, but I couldn't. Uh, and there's some other things here that, that you don't need to really see in person to understand. So it's, it's more the things that you're going to see in an inspection, uh, small items, and the concept and principles behind uh, what the function is of these items and how they fit into the overall system. Uh, I really like this diagram uh, for showing not only tank owners, but uh, people that don't know anything about underground tanks, maybe even use this in a DO training, although this is probably overkill for most uh, clerks and uh, t the people that work at gas stations. But some people like to know more about uh, what's going on than just the basics, so you could always leave this for them if you were a DO or if you have DOs out there that you want to give them a little boost so that their training is a little more robust, you could always consider that. Okay, so let me get my copy of the answers. The other thing I want to mention is there's, uh, there's at least one limitation or caveat on this diagram, and that's for the, the, the vapor spill bucket does not have a bucket on it, the vapor recovery port here. So I, I would just want to make sure that nobody gets confused and thinks that there doesn't have to be a spill bucket on the vapor, because th there does. But it doesn't show on this diagram. That's the only thing that I've been able to find on the diagram that could be maybe mis, uh, 
miscommunicated or confusing. Okay, Stephen, we're going to start with uh, double A. Can you run up here? Can you run up here with that? He, uh, he can. S Stephen can come up here. Tim will bring a couple of items up at a time, and Stephen can come up here. Okay, so we're talking about a uh, the double A is a is a mechanical turbine relay. So the Vita route controls the power to the turbine to the pump, and. So the Vita root is king, and I'm using Vita root in a general way, even though probably 99%, 95% of the installed base is Vita root. So I'm just going to use that term because it just kind of rolls off my tongue. There are other monitoring systems, as everybody knows. However, we're just going to talk about generally Vita root systems. If you have specific questions on other kinds of systems, we're happy to talk about that too. So the Vita root controls the power to the turbine because we all know how important it is to have positive shutdown and be able to turn off the turbine in case of a leak. So the, what the Vita route does is it controls the power that goes in to this relay. So if it disconnects the power to the relay, the relay opens, all of you saw these little contact points, and you see that they're kind of burned or darkened where metal goes from one side to the other side. Well, the Vita route can, can control this, but it cannot control or stop the turbine running if these points are melted together. How many of you seen this where the, tur where the points are melted together? Okay, a fair number of you. And for those that didn't, that's why I brought this. This is the weak link in the system. The Vita route can go into alarm, it can do everything it wants, but if these points are melted together, the turbine continues to run and no one knows why at the station. While the turbine's running, the thing's in alarm, what's going on? Nobody knows to open that little box and look at the relay to see if it's stuck together. Usually the relay box has a light on it, and so if the, when the points are connected, that light is, is uh, illuminated, and you can walk back, sometimes you walk back into where all the equipment is, all the nozzles are hung up, but the light is on. You're going, hey, how can that happen? Everything's turned off. Why the turbine shouldn't be running? Well, it's because the points are melted together. And you'll also see when you print out the, um, the alarm history in the setup, you'll see that the fuel in that tank is warmer than the fuel in the other tanks. Because the motor is running, it creates heat, and the fuel is there to cool it off. Well, if it runs 24 seven, then it's gonna heat up the fuel in that tank, and you can actually see it on the uh, printout. So whenever I go to a site that has mechanical relays like this, I always have them, the technician open the box covers, get a flashlight, look at the relays. Do they look like they're burned? Do they look okay? And if they are, okay, that's fine. If I go in and I see one that's burned and they're, they're stuck like this, the technician 100% of the time will go in, he'll tap it and it'll, it'll break loose most of the time. They say, oh, okay, we fixed it. I said, no, that's gonna be replaced. Uh, once is all you get. You don't get to just tap it and make it break loose because when we leave, it's gonna be melted together again and we're gonna have a, a big problem if the turbines can't be shut off when they need to be shut off. So this is only one kind of a relay. There are also electronic relays where you can't see the contact, the mechanical contact points. So this is in not necessarily older stations, but it's just a matter of uh, where they're installed. So definitely take a look at these and uh, you're gonna find problems there. Yes, sir. Are those relays automatically checked during the monitor certification? Question is, are these relays automatically checked during the monitor cert? I would say probably, I don't know. We do it, I, don't, I can't speak for others. Hopefully, I mean, you can see from a show of hands that people have found them burned together, so probably some other people are doing it. But that's why I'm bringing it up, is because it's something that can be overlooked. Rick's question is, do you need to be a certified electrician to change this relay? I'm not aware of any certification requirement for it. It's more or less a plug and play component. There's about, these are about $30. And they use, the contractors usually have them on their truck. That's how much of a problem they are. Okay. Is it in the Vita root panel? Is that where it is? No, it is not in the Vita root panel at all. And where is it located? 
It can be located all kinds of places. It might be up front by the cash register. It might be in the back room. And you'll hear them when you do the power out or when you check the uh, sensors. You, a lot of times you can hear them clicking, especially if, if you have a three tank system, you have three, three of these. When you hear them click on and off, it makes a pretty good amount of noise. But you can ask the technician, hey, show me where the relays are. Yes, sir. I was told by a technician if we redesign those, it would come on the mic. Now it's all the problem. Because then it wouldn't harm. They wouldn't melt the contacts. So comment is that if the if the mechanical relays were redesigned with a capacitor, they might function better. That's probably true. Uh, but you know, even thirty dollars sometimes we have to tell the station that product is offline until you can get a new relay. Uh, we're locking and pulling the yoke on the turbine, whatever it's going to be, before you can use that uh, product. That would be a great uh, best management practice is just change them every three years. And I think we're going to more of that as yeah. the PEI guidelines have started to uh, show some of these things. <coughs> okay, we're gonna move on to BB. Again, that is not on these charts because all of the alpha is uh, n something that's not on the chart. They're, they're sort of wild cards, oddball things that I threw in. So did everybody identify this as coaxial pipe? That's what I'm looking for is coaxial pipe. Stephen, can you show that up? That's the blue pipe with the test boot. Yes, and that's what I wanted to show too is that this test boot and also the test boot uh, has a Schrader valve on it. That Schrader valve is like a car tire, bicycle tire, and it has the core still in it. So if this boot was not pulled back from its original test position, that would mask any kind of a release from the secondary. So it's very critical. A lot of people do not want to remove these test boots. They don't want to slide them back and forth because it, it's difficult to move them after a couple of years. After six years, sometimes they just start to crumble apart. But they want to leave them in place. I say, okay, you can leave it in place. Again, we talked about this earlier in the week. As long as that valve is at six o'clock and the core is taken out, that way the secondary can communicate back to the UDC or back to the turbine sump or whatever other secondary containment is going to capture capture that liquid release. So that's the important point there. Uh, those boots have had a lot of problems recently and uh, it's a pain to have to replace them. Okay, we're on to number three. So number three is on our, our overhead. And I brought this in for a couple of reasons. Uh, you never get to see this in your hands because it's always connected underneath the dispenser. And this is what we call the shear valve, okay? Now shear valves can be part of a, a Bravo system, especially with the float and chain, uh, the chain uh, being a mechanism to uh, create, a, reduce the tension and so the, the spring-loaded valve will close. And so I left this, I took this apart so you could actually see that there is a plastic valve, a rubber valve body in there that would function at, to stop the fuel uh, if the, if the valve above it was cracked. And so that upper part of the valve is actually cast with a weakness in it so that it will shear and leave the components below it intact. So that you don't have one of those Hollywood uh, kind of movie situations where a car comes in and hits the dispenser and this gigantic flame comes out and there's uh, mayhem everywhere. The idea is that the fuel would be shut off by that valve. Now you also, the other thing that you have there is you have the pressure pushing up on that valve from below so that it seats really solidly. If you've ever seen, if you've ever been doing an inspection and the technician trips the shear valve and it's really, and you think, oh, I'm just gonna put it back and you can't move it by hand, it's because the pressure of the fuel wants to keep that valve closed. And so sometimes they have to use a little wrench to actually turn that valve to reopen it so that they can hook the chain back on there. It's because of the pressure of the fuel pushing that valve against its seat. The other thing I'll touch on too is that you can see this has a little plug in that port and that's typically where those snap taps are installed when you do your mechanical or electronic line leak detector. And I know there's a little controversy and it doesn't seem to be sorted out yet about whether or not those snap taps can stay in place or if they have to be removed after each uh, test. Uh, we talked about that last year, but I haven't heard much more discussion on that. Uh, I think it varies by agency. 
but there's a lot of technicians asking me now, do we have to remove the snap tap? And right now I'm saying, no, you can leave it. It's been in there for 20 years, so we'll leave it for now. Other names for shear valve? Impact. The whole idea is that something hits it, it breaks off, protects uh, the underground components, and from fuel being released to the atmosphere. What happened? Okay, crash valve is another one I've heard. All that same terminology of having something hit the dispenser. Okay, number four is a sump penetration fitting. Now, this is for a single wall sump. Uh, if anybody went to yesterday's presentation on infrastructure, Bravo, uh, the representative from Bravo showed a lot of different kinds of uh, sump penetration fittings. Uh, this was just an, an extra at a job site that I absconded with. They said, hey, we're gonna throw it away, so you might as well take it if you want it. Just as an example of what it looks like and how it gets installed. It looks like, it, it looks like the industry is moving away from these bolted uh, flange fittings and onto something that's bonded directly to the fiberglass. And uh, I'm sure all of us have seen the failures of these sump penetration fittings and uh, the amount of work and toil that it takes to uh, reconstruct those. Any questions on that part? Okay. So station number five, we've got a couple of different designs of piping, construction materials. Um, so we have a piece of single wall fiberglass pipe. Uh, there are also fiberglass pipes that are coaxial. The LCX piping is two pieces of pipe put together. And um, this, this pipe is really tough. I mean, you can, you can hit it. And I mean, I wouldn't suggest this on the job site, but these are really tough pipes. And I think it's still more or less a standard in the industry. And I'm sure there's some controversy about that, but um, we've never had trouble with fiberglass pipe. We have had trouble with flexible, and if anybody's uh, Hercules, if you could flex this a little bit for me, I'd like to see that. But it is flexible at some point, but it's also coaxial, meaning there's a pipe within a pipe. And this is just an example of a more modern, this is a newer generation of pipe from the blue one that we saw. And uh, these, are, these are now, all the new piping, all the flex piping has all the information printed on every, about every foot I think it is as far as uh, meeting the requirements for uh, piping, listed piping, where we didn't have that with a blue piping. So as things change, manufacturers become more sophisticated in meeting the requirements. Okay, uh, CC. Anybody know what CC is? It's a little bags. Siphon jet valve. Siphon jet valve. And what manufacturer is that installed on? Speak up. FE Petro, okay. How many different manufacturers of turbine pumps are there? Two that I know of. Okay, yeah. I'm not gonna count Tokan. So there's really, in a modern system, there's only two manufacturers of turbines. One's red, one's blue. The red one is Red Jacket, the blue one's FE Petro. So as soon as you get, you open up the sump and you see a, a, a blue head on there, you go, oh. I wonder if we're gonna have trouble with that siphon jet this year, because we sure did last year, and uh, the year before that, and the year before that, okay? So these little siphon jets get plugged up. It's a little ball uh, suspended with a spring inside that little brass housing. Without going into all the dynamics of how that works, when they malfunction, and they malfunction a lot it seems like, they get plugged up, and when they get plugged up, that ball doesn't seat. So what happens is air gets pumped into the primary line. So what do we know about hydraulics and the leak detector? The leak detector has to work with only liquid in the line. If you put air in the line, now you've created a cushion that can expand and contract. Liquid essentially does not expand and contract. It, it, it doesn't get compressed. Air gets compressed and it can fool the leak detector and make the, mal make the leak detector malfunction. So you're out doing a, um, a test on either a mechanical or electronic, and you're having trouble passing, what's the technician keeps calibrating, what's going on? Well, we quickly learned, if you have a blue, a blue turbine in the, in the sump, it's probably a siphon check valve. Let's just stop right here, go ahead and change the check valve out, and let's try again. Which means trying again, you have to do a lot of 
uh, pumping so that you can pump the air and the product out of that line because now you've charged it with air, you've got to get the air out. And it's usually 50 to 75 gallons, could be upwards of 200 gallons that you've got to push through the line to get the air out. So that extends your inspection time tremendously. Uh, so if you, ha if you see that problem with the leak detectors acting funny uh, or electronic line leak detectors, which in my experience are so bulletproof and so reliable and you don't see the, the gauge flicking and it's just sort of sitting there and just barely dropping to zero, duh, taking like 20 minutes, like, okay, there's air in the line and you've got an FE Petro pump, we know what's wrong. It's a siphon check valve. I don't know how much those things cost, but I don't think it's a lot. And they cause a lot of delay in the inspections. And so the other thing you have to ask yourself, okay, I left here last year, everything was working great. I wonder how long that leak detector has, not, has been compromised and not actually functioning because of the air in the line. So I know FE Petro's worked on that. They came out with a redesign. Uh, I don't know what they're doing right now, but definitely keep your eye on that component. Any questions on that? Okay. Okay, DD. So where are you gonna find this kind of sign? <coughs> Hopefully, some, every outside enunciator that's used by the, to notify the driver that the tank is at 90% is gonna have a sign. How many of you have fought with people trying to get them to put a sign? Well, everybody knows what that is. Somebody sees a red light and they hear an alarm. They're looking around, what's that? Where's that coming from? What's wrong? Well, you just put a sign on there and then everybody knows exactly what's going on. A lot of people put their, uh, put a, a, a phone number on here, a name, call Charlie if this goes off. You know, this is one iteration of that. But I know I had to fight with a facility for two years. They said, well, that's not in the regulations that you have to have a sign. I said, well, how's anybody supposed to know what it's for? Oh, they know, they know. I said, well, then how come you have all these overfills? Above 95%. Oh, I don't know. Well, put a sign up. So, crazy. You might even see multiple enunciators at a site and have two of those signs. Okay, here comes some fun stuff. How many people have actually, have ever seen this component with this orange label on it? I, I wish the water board would require these instead of mechanicals, but I know that's not gonna happen, but um, I think we'd all feel a whole lot better if they're all electronic. Um, so that one, and there's a big defining difference, is that an electronic line leak detector has a wire going to it, okay? Because that wire connects it to the Vita root, the brain of the system. It has to be wired, otherwise it can't communicate back and forth. Now this other image, number 11, that thing was just too heavy. My bag weighed uh, about 44 pounds. I thought, you know, that thing, if I put that in there, if I go to 51 pounds and they charge me $150 for that thing because of that, I decided to take a photograph of it, okay? Your hands will be a, are a lot cleaner as a result. So that is one example of a mechanical line leak detector, okay? That is a Vita root leak detector, I, th I don't know if you could read it on the other side, I tried to take a picture of the top. So there's Vita Root, there's a Vaporless, I know Vaporless is here. Uh, Effie Petro has their tall blue and beige and brown leak detectors. Uh, so there are a lot of different, men there's about three different manufacturers of leak detectors, so it's a pretty small world. But you're not gonna see a wire connected to a mechanical line leak detector because it doesn't talk back to the computer. It's, it's dumb, it's really dumb, okay? Unlike the electronic line leak detector that's smart and can do a lot of different things for the station owner and for the regulators. Now, one thing also that I wanted to point out, I left this orange tag on here for a reason. Did anybody happen to read this red tag? Okay, there's a really, something happened at a site, uh, I don't know, probably 10 years ago. They had electronic line leak detectors and we, it's at a, v, at a VP, it wasn't 10 years ago, it must have been seven years ago. It was at a VPH site. And we're trying to figure out some vapor lines and figure out uh, how come we don't seem to have vapor to this, uh, vapor vacuum lines to this uh, component? How come there's, there's no vacuum there? And um, so somebody had taken s some little port off the, uh, the Vita root head. Well, 
all of a sudden the Vita route turned on and gas started pouring out through this port. Well, if you read that tag, the Vita route, remember, it's commanded by the console. And the console says, hey, we got some wait period here. Let's run a test. Let's do a 0.2 test on the line while, we, while nothing else is going on. Well, there are always other things going on. We were standing around. Luckily, we, we hit the emergency shutoff and it stopped it. But your, that turbine is under the control of the Vita route, not under the control of the technician or the inspector or the station owner. So be very careful about taking anything out of that pressurized line when you, if, if that electronic line leak detector is active and everything is turned on, because it may decide to do a test and you're gonna be suffering because fuel is gonna come out of that point. And it could be either a physical injury, it could be a release, lots of different problems. But if you have an electronic line leak detector, you have to be careful and know that that detector is under the control of the Vita root at all times. I really can't stress that enough. Other things on mechanical line leak detectors, we talked about there being a wire connected to it. There's always another thing connected to a mechanical line leak detector and that's a copper tube. Or unless you have an E85 system, it's gonna be a stainless steel tube that allows the liquid that gets past the seals on the mechanical line leak detector, that fuel has to go back into the tank. And so that line communicates back into the tank so that fuel can, can bleed off and go back without any pressure, just drains back. But copper cannot be used with E85, so that's why they use stainless steel. Does anybody have E85 systems? Wow, amazing. Okay, we've got a couple of them. Uh, okay, anything else on, my, on line leak detectors? Okay, so I'm just gonna throw out one, a couple of numbers. So you see the number 0 0.2 gallon per hour, 0 0.1 gallon per hour. So, and it, it kind of gets, it kind of gets a little confusing, but I think there's a fairly simple rule of thumb that we explain to designate, during our designated operator training. A 0 0.2 gallon per hour goes with a monthly test, and a 0 0.1 goes with typically an annual test. Okay, so it's just kind of a cheat sheet way of keeping track of what number goes with what frequency, what release response amount goes with what frequency, that sort of thing, just to, so that those numbers don't become confusing. Okay, number 13. Number 13 over here, where's number 13? Right here. So we're looking at a sump, a piping sump where there's pressurized fuel in 13. So I brought a bunch of different sensors here. There's a bunch of different ways that they work, but primarily, these are all, all the sensors here are dumb, okay? They just detect liquid. There's a float mechanism. They, almost all of these work on a simple principle of resistance. The amount of ohms that's transmitted through the wire back to the Vita root. The Vita root reads that resistance and says, oh, I'm happy, I like that number. Uh, that's good, okay? Because the Vita root has to go out and look at each sensor, pull each one of those sensors and say, what is that number? Is that number within tolerance? And it's constantly looking at every sensor as it goes through. The more sensors you have, the longer that takes to happen. But it looks at each sensor constantly, not constantly, but as it goes through its programming. If the resistance that it sees is wrong, in other words, if you're supposed to be, have 100,000 ohms as normal, if all of a sudden somebody goes out and they cut the wire, okay, now there's infinite resistance because there's no loop back. The Vita root says, hey, wait a minute, I can't see you anymore. I don't know if you're out there, but we're gonna shut the system down because I don't know what's going on with you. You're off the reservation, so we're shutting down. So you'll see that at some points where the, the seal pack gets corrosion in it and the wires get frayed and so the resistance either goes way up or goes way down and the Vita root will shut the whole system down because that's that whole, uh, the whole capability of the Vita root to almost to be conscious of what's out there in the uh, monitoring, in the monitoring sections. So a couple of these other sensors work on different principles. Uh, the Boudreaux sensor here works on a, on a light path 
And uh, there's, some, there's one really old one here, uh, although I say old, I don't know, I think in our area we, we, have, we don't have any of these kind of proximity sensors. Do, do these look familiar to anybody? Anybody still using these? Yeah, they work really good, it's amazing. But um, they're really old, really old. Uh, what else have we got? Another thing I wanted to point out is that you probably saw these two black sensors these are Vita Root model uh, 420, okay? Probably everybody sees these. Now, has anybody ever seen one without a float? Okay, sometimes the floats fall off. Now, do you think that that puts the system into alarm? Because, well, without a float, how can I tell if there's any liquid out there? The answer is no. It does not put it into alarm. The float falls off, the Vita Root's still happy. So it's something to look for, especially on steel tanks. If you're monitoring steel tanks with these 420s, when you pull the float up, or, or pull the sensor up, and you dip it, and nothing happens, uh, sort of, huh. You might want to check and see if the float's fallen off. Because the pin that holds them on, a lot of those are metal, and they get corroded. And the pin falls off, the float stays in the annular space, and um, the Vita Root's happy, but you're not. So it's something to definitely look for. The newer models have a plastic clip, that um, doesn't corrode, and so they're much more reliable. But that's another one of those, you know, I'm trying to point out some of the weaknesses and things that could, um, that could hurt you or hurt the owner in uh, detecting releases. Right, this gentleman also mentioned that he's seen them mushroom, and when they mushroom, sometimes you, you have a difficult time getting them up through that, uh, through the riser. And we've actually had times where we had to just discard that sensor down into the annular and start over it because you just couldn't get it out. I haven't seen that for a long time. I think they've, I think they've, they've changed the metal uh, components of that uh, bell sensor. Okay, the other one I have here, does anybody know what kind of a tank this goes into? Fiberglass, right. Okay, it's a wraparound sensor, it goes into a fiberglass tank. Now how many people have had contractors they take the cap off the riser and they start to pull the string up and they hear the alarm go off and they say, okay, it's good. And, and what do we say to that? No. no, that's not good. What does Vita Root say? How do you test the sensor like this? The Vita Root protocol says you take this sensor out of the tank annular and you dip it in liquid at, the, at grade and see that it functions, examine it, make sure it's not damaged or decomposed. And uh, if I had a dollar for every time a technician's asked me that, I would be in Hawaii right now because it's... Uh, yeah, yeah. And then they work for another couple seconds and then, oh, oh, it did come out. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that's the wraparound sensor, and those come with different numbers based on their length. Okay, so we covered the fact that there's, there's also a sensor in there, a bright uh, chrome sensor that typically you'll find sort of interchangeable between Ronan and maybe uh, Autostick Junior. Um, people have probably heard that term before. It's, it's, it just it works on the same functionality of resistance. It just have a, has a probe but that's definitely not a Vita root sensor. Okay, number 18 is up on the chart, and how many of you have actually seen one of these? I'm, I'm just curious, a show of hands. Okay, not too many people, yeah, I thought so, because. So back uh, December 22nd, 1998, uh, hopefully everybody was born after that date, uh, there was a requirement that all tanks had to have a striker plate. Well. So we're out there and we've got tanks that were installed before we ever started permitting tanks. And we're wondering, well, do they have a strike? How are we gonna know? There's no records of who manufactured the tank or all of this information. So, so the technicians were smart enough to get a really strong magnet and a cord. And we would, in those days, we could take the drop tube out and we would drop that magnet down underneath where the drop tube was. And if the magnet stuck to the bottom of the tank, we knew there was a plate. So that was okay. If we couldn't, dis couldn't discover that or couldn't prove that, then we would slide one of these into the bottom of the drop tube. And this originally had a, um, a hard plastic, uh, about three eighths of an inch uh, P 
piece of material on the very bottom so that it wouldn't rub, the, the aluminum wouldn't rub on the bottom of the tank, it would rub on a rubber stopper. And so this would be slid into the uh, drop tube and uh, secured there and the drop tube would go back in and so that protected the bottom of the tank from having the stick. You know, when they drop the stick to get their measurement and it bounces back up and sometimes it didn't bounce back up. Uh, so this kept that from occurring so that we didn't drain the tank out through the bottom. And so they were compliant with the uh, December 22nd, 1998 upgrades. Okay, that takes us on to 18, 19, 21. 21, okay, so uh, I got some magic dust out and I shrunk this, okay. <laughs> it used to be eight feet long. No, actually this is the real thing. A uh, contractor donated this to me and so I was able to get this in my luggage so I was able to bring an automatic tank gauge with me. Um, it's a smaller scale from what you normally see but um, it is a tank gauge and uh, so you have a float for fuel at the top and a float for water at the bottom because we all know that petroleum floats on water so all the water is going to be at the very bottom of the tank and that's why there's a float down at the very bottom. Okay, so something, see I think we're doing okay on time, might have to move a little faster but something I want to mention, how many people have found water in gasoline tanks lately? Okay, do you find, a, it would have to be a lot of water. Because what's happening right now is, and I've had a lot of owners say, you know, how come there's no more water in my tank? I used to always, we used to always get water. Well, the thing is alcohol fuels will hold that water, not in a suspension, but in the matrix of the fuel. And so there's no more water because you're not finding it separated as a separate phase because it's in the fuel. Up to a point, and then you have a phase separation. And Vitaroot has a really nice video on their website that shows exactly what happens where you get that one extra drop of water and now you have a solution that won't hold that body of water and it all separates out, falls out. So this is the consequence. Your customers are filling up and you've had a phase separation and now you have eight inches of water on the bottom of your tank. The turbine is sucking water, sucking fuel off the bottom, maybe three or four inches above the bottom. But you've got eight inches of water. So now you're selling water to your customers and they're filling up their tank with water, okay? So they're, they're all, they don't know. They finish their transaction, hang up the pump, start their car, start driving away. Well, there's some fuel left in the line between the tank and the injectors, but they get a couple of blocks and all of a sudden, boom, the car stops, okay? Hopefully they're not all leaving the station on a right hand turn because all of those cars are going to start lining up down the street because their tanks have water in them and the engines won't run. And then they start getting on their cars and they're all wondering what's going on here? <laughs> well, you just sold a bunch of water and so now their engines may be damaged. It has a lot of consequences and Vitaroot has a really good uh, detail of how that whole thing works. So they've come out with a new mag probe that has a water sensing uh, element on the bottom that and if you program your Vita root properly as soon as it sees any amount of water it will shut down the turbine and so it's something to consider uh, or to, just to be aware of because if you stick a tank right now we never find water anymore in, unless it's a lot of water. Diesel fuel doesn't have alcohol in it so you'll still find water phases in diesel but uh, where the water went on gasoline is, is, is not a mystery. Okay, we're at number 23, okay. Any ideas on this? Speak up. Drain valve, yes, the infamous drain valve. How many spill buckets fail because of this drain valve? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I decided to take, get a good one that was clean enough to be able to hand around and you can see that it's a very simple device and the seal where it seals against the bottom of the bucket is not a sophisticated seal. And the environment that those spill buckets live in with dirt, gravel, debris, uh, cigarette butts, pencils, pens and everything else, these things get deteriorated and they don't seal anymore because 
uh, that little screen doesn't keep enough of the grit out. And so one piece of grit on that seal, and now you can have, when you're doing your hydrostatic test, water's going in. And if the seal, if it's not making a good seal, vapor is coming out. Uh, so it, it's certainly an area of concern, especially when you're doing those spill bucket tests and you, get a, you start seeing the water going down and it's going into the tank. Uh, so that's, that's one style of drain valve. If you have a fill tight, it doesn't have the same kind of valving. It's got more of a, a, a sort of a swish, kind of a back and forth action. Um, it's a totally different kind of mechanism, but it has its own problems as well. Okay, that takes us on to 24. I was really fortunate to be able to get this out of an old, out of a tank removal. But you can see that this um, flapper valve, uh, it's the predominant uh, overfill prevention device. And um, hopefully you had a ch chance to look inside and see that when this arm comes up, it kicks another little piece on the inside over and the weight of the fuel at four, 500 gallons a minute coming down against that seats that valve. There is a small little bleed back section so that the driver can drain the hose into the tank uh, once the valve uh, closes, but um, that's essentially the operation. Now, our friends from OPW have introduced a modification to this so that, because right now, there's no way, you're looking down, you go, well, I, when we permitted the installation of this, this, it was at 95%, we did all the calculations, but um, there's still some, well, maybe somebody else came out, out and redid it or worked on it, and there's no way of knowing. So OPW has redesigned this with a little, uh, a way to open and close the uh, flapper to raise and lower the flapper without taking any of the components apart. So you can see that on their, um, on their, in their vendor booth. I saw it yesterday, it's a very elegant design. So now in the future we'll be able to see that if that thing, you know, it could be that, that you could have this tube and when you look down the drop tube you can see that it's there, but you can't see if this f fell off or broke off, how do you, you have no idea. And if you try and j disassemble that whole jack screw assembly and pull everything out, then there's an air quality issue that has to be retested because that's a component of the vapor recovery in the EVR system. So uh, I'm sure other good things are coming for being able to test these kinds of overfills. Okay, 25. Oh, yeah, one of the things that we've seen, Mike, Stephen was mentioning, is that a lot of times we get to a site and we pull the cap to look down there and there's a stick down there. <laughs> Nobody knows how that stick got there. It just came from outer space. And sometimes you can't get the stick out very easily. So uh, it's so well jammed down in there. So definitely be on the lookout for sticks. And actually, I was at a, I was at a county site and we opened up the cap and there was no drop tube at all. I asked the facility manager, who took the drop tube out? What? <laughs> it's a big mystery. It's an unstaffed site, and, you know, with metals being stolen. Maybe somebody, you know, knows that, hey, there's a lot of aluminum in that drop tube and we'll just pull the cap off, take the jack screw out, boom. It was like, it's gone. So they had to put a new one in. Okay, are we at 25, okay. This is a pretty simple one, but the, the point of the, having this cap, uh, I also have the poppet valve assembly, but again, it was too big and heavy to bring, so I just brought the cap. So I wanted to mention that this orange cap on the vapor doesn't fit the fill cap, okay? They're not interchangeable. So you always have to have a, the orange one, and it has to have the, the whole uh, executive order component part to it, because everything is prescribed. If you have an OPW system, you have to have all the components. And, uh, and those caps, we see a lot of those caps that are cracked, broken, they don't hold, especially when you do your spill bucket test, and you fill the, the bucket above the cap, and the liquid starts draining down because the cap doesn't seal properly, so they get to buy a new cap. 27 is another part of a, this could be a component of a uh, overfill prevention. And so if they use this part, then I always ask them to take the cap off or the bucket off, depending on where this is located, 
And of course, there's always moans and groans. Oh, man, you're the only guy that ever asked to see that thing. Come on, man, it's late. I want to get going. I said, you know, that's part of this. You know, that's part of the thing. We got to do this part. So, you know, let's just do it. Get on with it. So you, what I do is I look down. I already know that they have the right length in there. So I just look down, and if I don't have a mirror, I use my watch and focus it at the sun and shine it down. And if I see a shiny silver ball, I'm good. The ball's still there. Because what happens is the cage gets corroded, and the ball falls into the tank, and then now you don't have any overfill prevention. So it is an easy way to check and to see if that's there without doing more disassembly. Yes. No, they're not. Morrison Brothers are just metal color, silver. Just depends on which manufacturer you have. He, the question was, are all vapor caps orange? And no, they are not. The other thing I wanted to mention is on those ball float vent valves, those cannot be used on suction systems. Because what will happen is once that, if fuel is coming in, is being loaded into the tank, and that valve closes so that air can't leave the tank, but pressure is building up in the tank, what will happen is all of a sudden your dispenser, the nozzle falls off your dispenser and fuel starts coming out onto the ground out the nozzle because fuel is finding its way out because it's under pressure and the only way for it to get out is to go out through the nozzle or to go out the vent cap. And you have a nice little foamy uh, diesel trail going out the cap and, and then finally liquid coming down. So those cannot be used on suction systems. And so then we have 28, I'm quickly getting to the bottom of the list. Again, just this is not the latest and greatest, but it, it's on our chart, so I thought I would just show you what it looks like. Uh, these are tested by air quality inspectors, uh, but it is a component. You will not find this component on a diesel tank, only on gasoline. Okay, EE. -E. Okay, this is not a bird bath or a component to a bird bath. This is for that Bravo system that is a deep Bravo bucket where you need the long rod to communicate the whole chain and the lever and the, the whole uh, mechanical system that gets kind of screwed up when they get too long and too spread out. Uh, the other thing that we're finding is that these floats, the black float, they get cracked and they fill up with liquid and then they don't float anymore. It's more like an anchor instead of a float. So, you know, I was asking the, uh, the Bravo manufacturer if um, testing the Bravo floats with water was an acceptable practice and he said it was. So it might be something to consider. Uh, usually what we do is we, we trip the chain, we raise the float, it trips the chain and make sure that everything can slide properly. But, People that use kitty litter to clean up spills, that kitty litter gets into the dispenser, gets around the edges of this and lodges this tightly. And so the whole, dis the UDC could fill up with fuel and this will never float. So that's another one of those weaknesses is that this, if this doesn't move freely, it's not gonna detect a leak and it's not gonna shut off that shear valve, which is a lot of people's uh, mechanism for instead of having positive shutdown. Another cap, this is, a, this is more of the silver metal cap. Um, amazing how many times you see these kind of caps. They have, to, they have this warning, do not fill. But still you hear these horror stories of uh, truck drivers putting fuel either into the ATG, into a monitoring well, into a clean out plug. It's just crazy, the stories I hear. But uh, these are uh, another part of that component. I think this is a Morrison Brothers cap. In fact, I'm sure it is. So this is for an automatic tank gauge, to get to the gauge itself. And then finally, we're down to the, this is a, we always take these plates, these plates are on every tank. And we do, when we do a tank removal, we always ask to have the contractor remove this plate from the tank before it goes to the TSDF or if it goes to, for uh, scrap metal, crushing, wherever it's gonna go. Uh, we retrieve these plates off of there so that that tank has lost its designation. It, it may be kind of a moot point, but it's just kind of the follow through that that is no longer a tank and it cannot be used again. 
Um, lately, I hear these stories about, oh, we take those tanks out to Stanislaus County and they sell them to people that want to use them to store water for fires or for cattle. And I said, well, none of our tanks are going to any place other than specific destinations and they're not going to be reused for water. Um, so kind of, you know, you might want to be careful about that. So anyway, that's this, uh, this one's aluminum. The, the newer tanks have aluminum, the older ones always had brass. So aluminum is a lot cheaper than brass and I think that's why you see aluminum on them now. But even a brand new tank will have a placard like this for the UL listing. <clears throat> Any underground tank has that kind of a UL listing. Even above ground tanks have those kind of listings on them, have a little placard like that. And they take a little bit different shape and sizes, but pretty much that's, uh, they all have that. All right, well thank you for coming and participating.